Um, so, uh, for anybody who encountered my uh, previous book, French Like Moi, you might know that I um, am inclined toward a slightly irreverent uh, look at the city of Paris. Uh, and so that was really the, the uh, gist and, and sort of the guts of that book. Uh, times change, uh, life moves forward, and in this book what I've got is still a hefty and healthy amount of irreverence, I think, but also trying to look at uh, what happens when life smacks you down and you're focused on uh, difficult periods in your life and how Paris might be able to come a little bit to the rescue. Uh, so that's the, um, that's the gist of it. Uh, lots of detail, of course, but I thought what I would do is just give you a taste from the very beginning of the book. Uh, and I think the plan is, so I've got about a six, seven minute reading here that I'll do, and then we'll engage in conversation, open things up, and, and then maybe read a tiny little section at the very end. Uh, but this first chapter is called Souvenir. Hands down, my favorite heist ever. It started innocently enough. I've been recruited to accompany a tour group in the Dordogne Valley, and my job consisted of giving a few lectures about life in France. The rest of the time, my wife, Anne, and I traipsed along with the herd of three dozen Americans. The local guide was a 40-something woman whose war robe still clung to her 20s. Marie Laure's long scarf flowed behind her as she steered the group uh, through quaint downtowns filled with replicas of ancient buildings. We tasted walnut oil and examined pots, admired endless churches with banks of stained glass. The tour specialized in the picturesque, and our dark-haired leader knew just what to show Americans. In the coach, she whispered to the bus driver about where to pull over for the next photo op, and at the chateau, she corralled everyone toward the West Tower, the one they had to see. We traveled from postcard to postcard, and I laughed it up with everyone else. Then came the evening they planted us in front of two hours of folkloric dance, performed by grim-faced locals in knickers and suspenders. The applause was thunderous, and for once people got to call out encore in the country that invented the term. <laughs> After the show, I chatted with one of the curly-haired dancers. While he sucked on a cigarette, I asked if they performed very often. He glanced around to make sure his boss was out of earshot. Nah, he said. He let the smoke stream from his nostrils. We just do this shit for the tourists. <laughs> I felt like a kid in Disneyland who bumps into Mickey on a cigarette break. The mouse had pulled off. Something was going on. Relax already, Anne said when I told her about it. Kick back and enjoy yourself. I tried. We went with the group to Lascaux, where we stood in line to stare at a modern reproduction of a prehistoric cave. One afternoon, we had a wine tasting and a cheese tasting and a chocolate tasting. The weather seemed made to order. The dial locked unpleasantly warm. Then, in Sarlaw, a man in our group wandered off down the side street, and Marie Laure chased him down like a border collie. <laughs> what didn't she want him to see? I couldn't shake the sense that there was a seam somewhere, the edge of a stage set. It all came to a head the day they brought us to the goose farm. As we hiked across the field to an outbuilding, I nudged Anne, lifted a foot, and pointed at the sole of my shoe. What, she said, see? See what? There's nothing there. I nodded vigorously. Exactly. A farm with no shit. <laughs> Her eye roll was interrupted by the arrival of those escorting us into yesteryear. There was a smiling man in pristine overalls, a beret screwed to his head, along with his father, hands knotted, trousers filthy, a sullen and wrinkled representative of tradition. The son, Martin, greeted us and trotted out a few jokes. He winked at Marie Lore and twirled an imaginary mustache, suggesting an amorous relationship. You know how we men are in France, he quipped. <laughs> the accent verged on outrageous. Everyone laughed. Behind him, the father, who was staring at nothing, went gray in the face, his shoulders rounded even more. The visit got underway. Step by step, we learned how they turned birds into little cans of foie gras the kind awaiting our arrival in the gift shop. There was all the breeding and brooding, the great out of doors and the free range. Eventually, Martin eased into the gruesome part that is hard to sugarcoat, the bit about shoving a funnel into the goose's gullet and pouring in the grain. But no, do not worry, Martin chuckled as he pantomimed the feeding. The goose, he don't really mind. 
He is a hungry bugger, the goose. He will take all you can give. The laughter turned to guffaws. With jolliness and a few exaggerated shrugs, Martin had turned goose torture into a knee slapper. In the background, the silent father, a reluctant extra in this performance, had gone ashen. What wouldn't he have given to be elsewhere, indeed anywhere, other than here, in front of a gawking audience, demanding that saucy Frenchness be enacted for them? And that's when the penny dropped. No, it wasn't just the geese who were being fattened up for slaughter. It was us, the Americans. For the past 10 days, the tour operator had stuck a funnel in our brains and was pouring in the cliches, gallon after gallon. Like the geese, we didn't even object. The more they gave us, the more we swallowed. Gluttons for that particular punishment, we were insatiable. I don't believe I've ever had such a sad realization. Everyone we'd encountered over the past week was complicit in the scam. The vendors, the tour guides, the hotelier, the waiters, and indeed, even the victims, who, myself included, wanted nothing more than to be duped and beguiled. We wanted the pretty stuff, like spoiled kids at the dinner table, we demanded dessert while refusing to eat our vegetables. But because we were kids with credit cards, they gave us whatever we thought we wanted. <laughs> On the ride back from the hotel, I stared blankly out the window as blurred countryside rolled by and tried to fuck me up, which somehow made it worse. All the others climbed off the bus before I could struggle to my feet, and then I stood outside the reception area, a bit dazed, not sure which way to go. Why bother? Everyone else had dashed off to put away their cameras and their goose paraphernalia before <laughs> heading out for dinner. That's when the first cry erupted from the hotel. It was a woman's voice, high-pitched and startled. Another woman responded, calling out something in English. A man joined in, then the footsteps began to thunder. Uh, members of our group were scurrying back and forth in the corridors, thumping on doors, checking on their friends. Were they okay? Had their room been broken into as well? A heist. The rest was like a waking dream, the scenes flowing together. Outraged Americans mobbed the front desk. The manager with slick backed hair literally wrung his hands. Mari Lohr ran this way, then that, flummoxed by this event she hadn't figured on, or that hadn't figured on the itinerary. Finally, a siren sounded, and a little green car screeched to stop uh, out front, a troop of gendarmes tumbling out of it. While we were away, someone had gone through the hotel and ripped the wall safes from the wardrobes in the bedrooms. Wallets had vanished, jewelry, even passports. How would we pay for our meals? What did we need for insurance? Who knew how to fill out a French police report? What if, and now people started buying the stack, it was an inside job? <laughs> Just like that, the postcard of our French experience had been ripped asunder. Anne glanced at me and did a double take. What's up with you, she said. You're beaming. <laughs> she was right. I was imagining the grandpa at the goose farm. How he'd have relished this scene. Life was just too wonderful. Oh, sure, we lost a few bucks. There'd be insurance claims to file. But better than any souvenir, we'd finally been granted something real and unreproducible. A genuine memory. <laughs> the gendarme were now frisking the chambermaids one by one. Anne began to giggle, covering her mouth. While pandemonium swirled around us, the snorts erupted, her laughter fueling mine, mine turbo boosting hers. Uh -huh. Oh my God, she said, wiping a tear from her cheek. This is one for the books. I'm going to remember it forever. <laughs> yep, I thought, drunk with happiness. Me too, forever. That was so many years ago. Only problem is, forever never lasts as long as you think it will. Back then, I didn't know how time passes, how the future creeps up on you, and how sometimes, when you look over your shoulder at yesteryear, what was supposed to be forever has faded from sight. So, <clears throat> that's, the, that's the opening of the book, and I should just mention to explain a little bit where it's headed, um, that uh, my wife ends up um, fading and succumbing to, fading with and succumbing to early onset Alzheimer's disease. So a problem with memory at the same time that she's uh, in a very memorable place. Uh, this starts before going to Paris, but then we end up in Paris and 
uh, the story um, also uh, addresses how Paris can help you rebuild your life after that kind of a loss, and it leads to what I think of as a rather miraculous conclusion. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> with those light comments, <laughs> let's let's move uh, forward. If I can figure out how to detach this. I don't know if they have on and off buttons, so I'm just gonna. Okay. Um, that was a lovely reading. Thank you. And what a great setup. Happy That's to really serve. Well, <laughs> uh, so for those of you who haven't seen the cover of the book, Up Close and Personal, Paris Lost and Found, doesn't look like a lot of the books that you expect to see about Paris. You know, at first glance, you're like, what the heck is that beat up looking teddy bear? It's only later that you see this little tipped over Eiffel Tower kind of lying in the street with a bunch of trash. So I wanted to start with the thing that came to mind when I saw the cover. Besides, what a weird cover to choose. After I read the book, I understood the cover a lot more. And it brought to mind this um, quote from The Velveteen Rabbit, where the skin horse says, generally by the time you are real, most of your hair has been rubbed off, and your eyes drop out, and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all, because once you are real, you can't be ugly, except to people who don't understand. And I feel like that's how this book was about Paris for me, and also about love, um, which you write about quite beautifully, and the bittersweet experience of being in a place that is so memorable and so full of beauty and charm at a time that there was not a lot of that going on, you know, for Anne, at least. Right. Um, so there's a unique perspective in this book, and I share a lot of the, of the experiences that you described. I lived in France twice, um, most recently in Paris, when I was a Fulbright scholar there, which was supposed to be the most magical and romantic and fabulous of experiences. And instead, it was one of the hardest times of my life. And Paris, rather than welcoming me with open arms, felt like a closed vault, or maybe a shop window that I could see everything inside that I couldn't get at. And I think that living in Paris as a Midwesterner, in particular, is a unique experience. So to have that described by someone else um, who was going through it at a different age, I think was really lovely for me. But going through Paris as someone who is suffering in any way, shape, or form is very different than going through Paris as someone who's whooping it up. And I wonder if you could just share a little bit about why you decided to share some of these grubbier, more real parts, both of the city and of your own experience, rather than writing something more fanciful. So, so Pilar, you, you realize there are 16 questions in that in <laughs> what you just mentioned. Um, so maybe I'll try to address. I'll, I'll try to address a couple of them, and then you can kind of redirect me. Um, but I think that it's true that Paris is. Paris can be a very difficult city. I mean, probably most of you here have been to Paris at some point. My guess is, even if you have not been to Paris, you've probably heard of Paris. You've probably seen Paris. You've, you've seen it in movies. You've seen it on. Uh, postcards, you, you might have a Mona Lisa or fridge magnet. I mean, it's just everywhere. You watched Emily in Paris. So it is this um, highly romanticized um, destination that people know before they even get there. And by definition, the experience that they have, you have, we all have when we arrive, is different from what we expect. There's no way that it could ever match that. And it's unlike other cities in that respect because we don't know that much about other cities that we go to, so we're a little bit more open. In Paris, we're often expecting certain kinds of things. Uh, so there is the possibility of a gap between um, the expectation and the reality, and that gap could be, could possibly be, like it could err in the direction of Paris being even better than it is presented, but because it's presented as the absolute peak of everything, the gap almost always means that we'll be somewhat disappointed. Um, and as you say, when you're there for a long period of time, if you're there as a tourist, you can uh, sort of lean into uh, some of the illusions of Paris. But when you're there for longer, you then have to deal with the nitty gritty of everyday life. Uh, and that does take things down a step in that, what I think is a very healthy way. Mm -hmm. And there's often an initial shock, which is to discover that Paris is more difficult, more complex, more uh, a little grittier and everything than the, um, the movies make it out to be, but it's also richer, it's more vibrant, it has so much more going on than we ever really um, expect, uh, that once we get through that initial period of difficulty, then we discover uh, that richness. Yeah, and that realness, that realness yeah. that I feel like 
and particularly when you're going through something as real as having your loved one kind of like the tiles of memory falling away as you describe it and wanting to share something like that the best of the experience and have it not really be accessible and I think that that's something I really enjoyed about the book, the mix of the dark and the light, the levity and the kind of grubbiness. Um, you know, within the first few chapters, we in are introduced to everything from turds, rats, uh, street rage, the hotel theft, grumpy neighbors. I certainly had my share of that. And it does seem to be a characteristic of living in France, in Paris in particular, that I would think if you were actually feeling down, for me, it would be harder to in encounter that. But you somehow seem to turn it into hilarity. And there's a lot of like joy in your description of even these dark, creepy moments. And I yeah. wanted to ask you, do you feel like that is something, I know you're a literature professor, did literature expand your appreciation of that kind of range? Or do you think you came into the world with that range and thus appreciated both these experiences and as they're described in the literary yeah, I, I think it's my own personal character flaw right? <laughs> that, that I just see things as funny, um, e even even in the darkest of times. Uh, so there are times when life just kind of plunges you into the sea of misery, right? And uh, But I don't know, you, you can either choose to sink or swim. And um, if you're going to start paddling around and try to stay afloat, one of the great things to, you know, you, you say levity, right? So levity means lightness. It helps to buoy you up. Uh, and that is really what I experience on a regular basis. And, and it's true, it's not just me, but it was also for um, Anne in those earlier chapters when she was still able to enjoy things. Um, it was just uh, weird and fun to discover these small little dramas that were taking place in our neighborhood. And it's one of the great things about being in um, a neighborhood again and again and again over years and decades that you get to know the fabric of the place and whenever there's a small opportunity for a story, a little bit of drama, then you get to kind of pull that loose thread and, and watch things unravel and see how it, see where it leads. Yeah. Okay, I have a question for you. Yeah. At some point in the novel, I mean in the memoir, you say that you had been fired by not, maybe even one, but possibly two therapists. Is this true? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay. Do I need to share all the details? No, I, can't, I, can't. I just no. wanted to make sure I had confirmed that. I wanted to ask you if you feel like now that you have written this book, and you know, your former book, French Like Moi, which you say is not a sequel exactly, but sort of pre a predecessor to this one, another memoir-ish set in France, do you think you would get fired by a therapist now? Or do you feel like you had some experience there that was healing enough that you might be able to get fired by? Yeah, so I, I don't think that I was fired because I was somehow uh, like such a difficult case. Uh, I, I don't really know why I was fired, but uh, anyway. Um, so I guess the question is, what is the question? Do I do I need? Should I be in therapy right now? <laughs> Talk to me. Ask me questions. Well, and my then question I will, is, my question is, do you feel that the writing yeah. of the book was a healing experience yeah. for you? Yes, actually, I think there is something. Um, uh, I think there can be something curative about travel uh, to begin with. Right? And, and a lot of people experience that at some level of you've gone through something difficult and, um, and that difficulty is tied to a particular place and, and you want to leave, you want to go somewhere. So that part is, is already part of it. But I think it's also the, um, the experience of novelty that you want to also start rebuilding something. You want to have a life. And sometimes that's not so easy in um, when you're stuck in sameness, yeah. right? So that being able to move away and then discover a certain kind of novelty and, and new stories, mm -hmm. I think, uh, at least for me, I think was very helpful. Yeah. And not just experiencing them, but then also writing about them mm -hmm. uh, because it's a way of organizing one's experience uh, and um, it gives shape to things that might otherwise be shapeless and it gives you a little bit of a sense of understanding, yeah. uh, which, yeah, and, and the word that comes to mind too, I think, is savoring. There's a, you savor the creepy experience of going to the basement and trying to figure out why there are rats, you, why there are human turds in the lobby. Why? It's not, it's not <laughs> all rats and turds, I just want to say. No, and there are also moments, I feel like, where you're savoring, um, I'm thinking of the scene in the subway where you're helping the young woman with the lamp with the many arms and tentacles. 
and you know you see also seeing yourself in the windows and this kind of dark-eyed sad looking person but you're witnessing yourself and in a way savoring your own process and i think when we it has a quite a happy ending i'll, I'll share that um, people love happy endings but i think that that willingness to embrace the dark and to be saturated in some of it is not something that most people writing memoirs about Paris are willing to do. It's like a kind of breaking a, a wall, you know, a third wall or something. Um, did you, have you gotten any kind of like disappointed feedback from people who are just Paris lovers? Like how could you show Paris in its dirty underwear? <laughs> any angry? Yeah, so I mean the book is so new that the the complaints have not yet rolled in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I'll, be, I'll check my. I, I'll check my. Uh, Don't my take this as an assignment. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I did so with French like Ma, which I mean, it, it, people seem to enjoy it a lot. But maybe it's not for everybody. And I had somebody say, like, this book taught me nothing. Um, I, I was trying to figure out how to organize my trip. <laughs> well, it's true. It does fail as a guide. Um, so there, there are certain audiences that it's not going to reach. Um, but I think that for people who um, uh, don't want to, what do I, so I, I sometimes think of this as um, a baguette polishing. There are baguette polishing books that are just shining up the cliches of Paris. Uh, and, and that's fine. I mean, there is uh, a place for that. And and, uh, and Paris does hold a kind of a pristine, um, I don't know, it's a kind of a trophy or something in people's imagination. Emily in Paris. Em yeah. Emily in Paris, right? Yeah. Emily in Paris has a little bit of self-irony built into it as well. Uh, but not, not all uh, productions do. Um, but so for somebody who wants to get a little deeper into it and see that um, yeah, the, the scales can fall from your eyes, and, and Paris ends up being something else and other, uh, but really magnificent. And even though you, you've underscored the, uh, the turns and the rats, which, which really are in the book, but, but there's just so much that is so vibrant and touching, and uh, these small anonymous kinds of interactions that you have with people in a world capital like that, such a densely populated city. It's one of the most densely populated cities in the world. Uh, so it offers... Uh, a lot of other opportunities, I think. What parts did you most enjoy writing? Like when you, when you think about like getting to play certain scenes or having to kind of crafting certain scenes, is there one or two that just jump out at you as like that is fun to write? Well, I'll mention uh, one of the stories in the book. Uh, so there is this grand narrative of um, you know what is happening to me throughout the book, but then each chapter is also a little bit of a standalone anecdote, somewhat. <laughs> Uh, and, and one of them has to do with an argument that is breaking out in front of my building. So I hear some squabbling going on, and I look out, and it's like, oh, golly, these guys are kind of really going at it. And is it fisticuffs? And suddenly a guy is kind of like going back to his car. He's so mad. He's just furious. He's hopping mad. He's back to his car. He's rummaging around. And he's like wrenching open his glove box, and I, he's got a convertible. So I can see right in. I'm looking down, and I'm like at the theater, right? I'm watching all of this, and I think, I know exactly where this is going. How do they not know? I mean, this is in the States, you would know exactly where this is going. So this chapter is all about guns. Um, and uh, so one of the great uh, little delights then is writing something about this, saying, you know, I don't know that much about guns really anywhere, uh, but, but I do, I know a little bit in the States, but I don't really know that much in France. And so uh, then I gave me, myself these assignments, and so I, I found a shooting gallery in Paris. It was like sort of homework, I, research, it was research. <laughs> so I had to go and get a lesson um, at how to shoot a gun uh, in Paris, which is a very unusual thing. Paris doesn't have guns. Or uh, open shooting ranges like we have, we drive 15 yeah, miles out. That, that's <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I can I write a little bit about that in the States as well. But So there are things like that where it's like, oh, this is going to be interesting. Yeah. Um, one of the things that struck me as also very lovely about the book was intersection of like the heartbreak of losing Anne and the life that you had together and having to release that. In a way, it, it was sort of an allegory for me. It reminded me a little bit of releasing the expectations or the attachments that we have of a lovely, of a beloved place. And then you go through this kind of dark period where I think you're subsisting on potato chips and jam. <laughs> um, and becoming more and more sort of, I don't know if you're resigned or you're just in a place of kind of hitting rock bottom. And then you sort of describe coming back out and being willing to entertain the possibility of loving again and of finding yourself back in a romance. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I wonder, when you were writing about that, you somehow managed to avoid most of the cliches of this. There's a great scene where you start, I don't know what you're doing, like opining about where the crazy parrots in your neighborhoods have come from, and the woman that you're seeing corrects you about where the origin of these stray parrots come from. A great example of humility. I'm wondering if there are other scenes in the book or moments in writing the book that connected you with your own humility, but also sort of released you of the burden of a former self and allowed you to feel you were moving forward. Yeah, what a great question. Um, yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, I think there are, um, in, in any kind of memoir, that you, you hope that there are moments of self-awareness, right? Self-discovery. Um, and that self-discovery can be, uh, it could be like that self-discovery of how, how great a person you are. Oh my God, I'm such a great person. <laughs> um, but in my case, it wasn't often that. Right? It was often a discovery of how, you know, oh, I guess I blew that. I guess I made a misstep there. Um, and so I think that there are ways in which there is a, and maybe that comes with age too, like a kind of ratcheting down of expectations mm -hmm. and coming to terms with how uh, unfortunately human we each are, uh, or at least I am. <laughs> Uh, and so there are a number of scenes in the book that uh, show some of that. Uh, so my own fears coming out on uh, the trip that I take to a cemetery, for example, that's one. And on uh, the scene that you talk about um, with in the metro helping somebody, and it's like, that's a very, it's a simple, it's a very simple story, but also kind of touching, but also seeing myself in a, in a way that I hadn't expected to see myself. Yeah. And then, um, I guess, recognizing myself. Yeah. In that's another great thing about traveling abroad. It's sort of like they say culture shock is when you come back. But when you go someplace and you're, you know, an étranger or étranger, and other people are looking at you like you're the weird one, you know? I, and I think that's something too that's like, you, I experienced that reading it. I like the scene where you're going with your neighbor. So you're, you're like in an HOA, a homeowners association for apartment building. If anybody has never seen one of these older buildings, they're just hilarious and full of all weird mysteries and everything very dirty, despite the best efforts of the maids and found the garage or whatever, but you're going down into the basement to find out where the rats, I hate to insist on it, but that really stuck with me, obviously. <laughs> and your French neighbor is like wearing like glossy little flats and pedal pushers and a cashmere sweater and a scarf, and you're like have pushed your pants down into your socks like you're going out. Masking tape around, duct tape around. Duct tape. And she just thinks you're ridiculous. <laughs> and this is like a, I think a classic thing where you are kind of made fun of in a way or seen as the other. From my experience, that's like I felt like you were sharing places that you were recognizing yourself through the eyes of others. And it almost gave you a little bit more leeway to decide how you wanted to define yourself hmm. next. Uh -huh. Do you see yourself, when you're in Paris now or in France, do you try to pass for hmm. French? Do you like the feeling when you get away with it? Or are you still kind of comfortable with the idea of you're an American in Paris? That used to be the big goal, right? Mm -hmm. Is to, it's like, oh, make sure that, you know, it's like wear the right clothes, wear the Lacoste jacket, put on the, see if you can, and, uh, and, and less and less, that's my goal. And uh, so I just sort of like try to be me. Uh, and, but I've been in France for a long time. And, uh, and it turns out that sometimes I feel like a foreigner in the US that I'll say, uh, you know, like I just blunder in and I say something kind of stupid here. Um, and, and, but I do the same in, in France, right? I'll just sort of advance something. And in that same chapter, I at one point suggest Oh, no, actually in a previous chapter, we won't go into the details, but I suggest that we get a surveillance camera. Well, that seems, because there's some stuff going on, let's put in a surveillance camera. It's like, it, it pushes all the wrong buttons. Like, oh no, in France this could never be done. And it's like, this seemed like a pretty uh, common sense approach, but it turns out that common sense is also very cultural. Um, and, and even having spent so many years there, um, I'm uh, prone to making missteps as well, and uh, and it's always it's surprising because I kind of know where some of the elephant traps are, but there's always a new one waiting for you, and you just kind of fall right in. Yeah, and that's I think back to the humility piece and just human evolution over the course of a lifetime. I was in Paris when I was really young, and like early twenties, and I went back there recently, and I had a very different experience as being a woman of a 
certain age, as they say there. And I felt like there was a kind of redemption for me of being in the city, finally like enough money to eat yeah. and go places and do things, which I couldn't when I was a starving student. Um, I'm wondering, having written two books that are memoirs of your time in France, do you anticipate writing a third from this sort of postscript of where you left off at the end of this book? I'll say it's got a happy ending. I will let people read it for themselves. But um, do you see another one in the works? I don't know. I didn't see this one in the works when I finished the last <laughs> one. Um, so the problem is that these stories keep happening. And so I, I, I do have, like, I've got these notes and I'm thinking, okay, what do I do with this one? What do I do with that one? There's too many writing projects, but it is not inconceivable that there would be another one. Uh, the city is delightfully inexhaustible in that way, uh, that it keeps producing small dramas, and as long as I am invited to participate in them, I guess I'll probably keep writing about them in some fashion. Well, speaking of participation, we should open it up to this crew and see if any folks have questions or observations or interesting experiences to share. Yeah. started a little bit of it, but um, uh, I, I, as, as you know, actually, I'm on the, this journey, and uh, in the early chapters when you uh, are referencing Anne, then, uh, uh, those strike too close to home, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, is it uh, as such that I wonder if I should continue? Mm -hmm. uh, and I know it has the uh, happier ending someone uh, in my stage uh, on this journey uh, continue to read? Is that, is that, would that be helpful? Is that yeah. yeah, that's a good question. I wish I knew the answer. I, I think that the, um, so everybody, uh, so if I think about what's going on in this book, I do have a particular tale of loss. I mean, it's all in the title, right? Paris lost and found, right? But a loss and also a finding. Um, and But everybody, there's something universal about it, which is that we have all dealt with loss, right? And, and we're dealing with losses that are closer to us or farther from us and um, at just sort of different degrees. And there are sometimes things that are so close that uh, there is still a kind of a rawness. I think one of the advantages for me of writing is that it helps me put things at a little bit of distance. And we were speaking about the curative um, properties of travel, but I think for me, it's also the curative properties of writing. Uh, that it allows me to process things to some extent. And I think there is a way in which reading, the way reading is also a kind of writing, that you know, people write their own stories as they're reading. Um, and so that for some people that may also be helpful, but it may not be for everybody. Um, the section dealing with loss is uh, just the first few chapters and then it moves um, through uh, dealing with uh, that sort of rebuilding phase, uh, which I hope people will find heartening and, and um, uplifting, but uh, I can't fully answer the question for you. Yeah. Why French culture and France in the first place? How far, far back in your life did you make the choice to specialize in the language, to go to Paris, to take students to Paris, what called you to that culture? And then why not Brazil or Portugal or, you at, know, at what Japan? age did I choose yeah. this or at yeah. what age was it forced upon me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's why. Yeah. Oh, really? Yes. This was, I did not go willingly uh, into that. Uh, so French was force fed to me from uh, fifth grade on. My parents, for some bizarre reason, although they spoke French, decided that it was important for me. We could call my mom. She's, she's 93. We could call her and find out, Mom, why is it? Okay. Uh, but, um, Wait, you've never asked. Uh, well, <laughs> she and the therapist later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Pilar. No, thank you. <laughs> um, so I was pressed into it. I was dragged to Paris on a school trip. We stayed in a grotty hotel with 
cockroaches um, in the bread basket and things like that. I never ever, I swore I would never return. I, I was forced to return. I was forced to take more French. I was forced to take it through high school. I swore when I got to college saying, God, I'm done with that. I started doing other languages and other things. And then I thought, well, maybe just one more class. And that was the beginning of the end. <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> I, so, I, I, um, so it was this sort of turning point. What I really, I didn't like, um, unlike other people, I chafe when somebody tells me I have to do something. I'm sure none of you do that. <laughs> uh, but I was told that I needed, I had to do this, and so I didn't like it. And then as soon as I did it, because it was my own choice, suddenly it's like, oh, actually it's not so bad. Um, that said, I spent a lot of time in the provinces um, at first, and I, I really enjoyed living in southwestern France, and, um, and then went to Paris somewhat begrudgingly, and had an experience maybe not unlike yours of finding it difficult, um, and so it took a while to really connect with it. Um, and that was more pushed back to Paris because of work, because of taking students and things like that, and then over the decades kind of fell in love with the place. <laughs> uh, I just have a thought and a question in sort of following up on the gentleman's question, um, and I don't, I don't know who was it? Bob. Right in the corner, Bob. yeah, Bob. I don't know your situation, so I would never presume to say this would be a, a, a book that would be painful or, or healing to read, but I, I will say, and this is my question, that I felt like, you know, that ver the very darkest point is handled really delicately and and quickly really and I wondered wh why that was I'll probably ask that question the next time I see you but um, yeah I was curious about that handling of it and and whether that might make it I don't know hard, easier or harder for people who are going through a similar journey to to read yeah so I mean uh, I'm trying to think about how to answer without I mean there's also just the like the enjoyment of discovery of how the story is told and everything mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's true that at a certain point I draw the veil mm -hmm. a, a veil over uh, some of the darkest um, most difficult things mm -hmm. uh, and um, so it is also because uh, for me I don't want the book to be all about that mm -hmm. right that there is a section um, a kind of there are aspects of loss that we are all uh, familiar with in sort of general terms and sometimes very specific terms and difficult terms and everything. And I didn't want to have the story get stuck there. Uh, that for me, it was then really a question of when this happens, this thing that happens and that many of us will experience in one fashion or another, what then? What do we do? Mm -hmm. And so I really wanted it to focus on that kind of rebuilding and the new kinds of opportunities. Uh, so I was trying to maintain that balance that made me lean in that direction of saying, okay, done with this, now moving forward. Any other questions? I had the benefit of uh, spending some time with this man. <laughs> A different trip. <laughs> A different trip. <laughs> um, but this was, he fell in love again. He's a different man. And I'm wondering what falling in love did to your perspective in this particular issue. Well, you know of what of which you speak, um, <laughs> right? So I'm also speaking to somebody who has uh, um, suffered loss and uh, and recovered. I would say, um, yeah. So I mean, that is it's um, it is a kind of it's not uh, just a return, right? It's a new, it's a brand new departure. It's just being able to see things in a whole new light, uh, which has just been absolutely reinvigorating for me. Uh, just a brilliant adventure. I hope you have a few more adventures. <laughs> <laughs> but, but not too many more loves. Yes, you that's right. Yeah. No more loves. <laughs> Be careful how you phrase that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So, dwelling on culture for a minute, um, you seemingly have sort of mastered 
for lack of a better term, French culture had to spend a tremendous amount of time there. French culture mastered me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a, a meeting of the minds. Yeah. The dominatrix. Um, yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you find yourself at that point um, maybe desiring to branch out and, and immerse yourself in some other very foreign culture, whether it be you know, Greek or Portuguese or Italian, for example? What, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> So, uh, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm kind of infatuated. I'm a language junkie, kind of, right? And so um, uh, I am uh, currently uh, planning, along with somebody else, uh, to spend a certain amount of time in Italy. Yeah, but my, my assumption would have been Italy. Uh -huh. It's even Rick Steve's favorite country, but keep going. <laughs> yeah. Well, nobody's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so, I mean, for me, I wanted to be places that I can go where I can communicate. And uh, so it's very important for me to have that uh, the interaction with individuals. I can't like I, I just want to be able to um, I want to speak to people on their terms. I don't want to just make them always speak to me on my terms and my language. Uh, so you know, my Italian is pretty terrible. Uh, David can attest to that, uh, but it can be kind of functional and it can get better. And uh, there's just something, uh, there's something so thrilling and terrifying about throwing yourself into a culture where you don't really master it at all, and uh, you think maybe you can come out of this alive. I'm going to the supermarket. I think I'll come out of it alive. Maybe not, you know. And uh, so yeah, I'm very uh, keen to have those kinds of adventures. I, I can say that Scott's name in Italian sounds great. Uh, Scott, uh, I mean, <laughs> over from our, our, our yeah. guys in Italy. But um, I want to pick up on a couple threads and ask you, <clears throat> you situate yourself in these memoirs, understandably, as a, a Midwesterner, as an American in general, a Midwesterner in particular in Paris. And so my question is about you and the Parisians a little bit more. For all that you tried for a time, it sounds like, to assimilate and not appear as an American or a dreaded Midwesterner, perhaps. Uh, they saw through you, um, it sounds like. <laughs> the name like Scott Carpenter probably gave you away. Um, but I'm curious in the ways that, were there ways that you used that stereotype that Parisians have of Americans, right? You're, you're not a tourist, you're someone living there mastered by French culture or whatever, somehow you've assimilated in some ways, but not fully. So some of the stereotypes that Parisians have about Americans or Midwesterners, were you able to use those and, and leverage those? Did you fight against them? I don't know, just an anecdote or two about living for many years as a Midwesterner among Parisians. Yeah, so um, in, in the first book, in French Like Moi, I talk about um, a period when I found myself uh, with an irregular visa status um, and was uh, hauled into a police station uh, and, and grilled a little bit, um, at which point it was helpful. So then, I mean, my French is pretty good and everything, but, uh, but then it's like, maybe, maybe you let a little bit of the American accent come through. And it's like, oh, I didn't understand. I didn't, you know, so there, there are ways that one could uh, do that. I don't think I've done that very much, but I think there have been a couple of times that I've maybe feigned uh, ignorance, um, and, and maybe I've gotten away with it. <laughs> I, I hesitate to say more in case, uh, you know, there, this session is, the session is in fact being recorded, right? Yeah. <laughs> On some threads again, um, I think it might have been Edwin Dwight who said that Paris is a difficult butterfly to net. And um, your story is resonating with me in several ways. Of I didn't have, don't have a spouse with Alzheimer's, but when my mother died, I had the same experience. The first thing I did was go to Paris, mm -hmm. and it changed my life. And so the question I have, other than your very good point of we come to Paris knowing it because it's in our, almost in the air that we breathe as Americans, 
But what is it about, nobody says that about London or about Rome or even about New York, about that power to find yourself. What is it about New York and about Paris? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, it's difficult, right? So uh, Paris has long been such a magnet um, that uh, so people flock to it for many different reasons. They say that at any given moment there's a, a population of about 100,000 Americans in the Paris region, which is a lot of people. And some of them are there for work, but some of them are, are there to find themselves, right? Uh, so it does turn into this uh, kind of crossroads. I think it is uh, partly because if you're going, you, you want to find yourself, you have to go somewhere, right? Uh, so, I mean, not to be too simplistic, but you have to go somewhere. And, and Paris has done such an incredible job of marketing itself since the middle of the 19th century. It's a very long-standing thing. So, if I've got to go somewhere, where will I go? Should I go maybe to the most beautiful, most unforgettable, most romantic city in the world? That might be good. It's probably not a good reason to go, right? Because your expectations are here. And the, uh, but I think it does draw a lot of people there. Um, uh, it's also this interesting kind of intersection of the foreign and the familiar. Right, that if you're going to go somewhere uh, to find yourself, and you, you could go to you know, Timbuktu, but it's kind of hard to get to, you're not going to speak the language, it's, you know, who knows what the, uh, the food is going to be like. You know, so you could do that, um, but going somewhere that is foreign enough, um, but also familiar enough, because you've seen it, it operates in that kind of in-between zone uh, that might make it an attractive destination. I don't know, maybe you have a thought about that. I think that's as good an answer as I can come up with. I mean, I think that there's a draw to, to the obviously attractive, um, but I think everyone else, there's an idea that you're gonna come home with a great story. I went to Paris and dot, dot, dot. Like, it just, everyone's gonna be interested in hearing that story, I think, as we are interested in yours. And I know there's a place, uh, I think it's chapter 18, a section called Epiphany that I would love for you to read. Okay, so. And then we'll sign. Don't, don't worry, I know that we're sure. like running, we're running over, this is, this is very short. Um, <clears throat> it's short if I can find it. Yes. Uh, so this is a chapter called The Thing I Saw, Epiphany. A uh, thing I saw is a kind of a French genre, that, uh, that little tiny vignettes. Um, while trudging home with groceries, cutting through an empty side street toward the Rue Bobillot, I asked myself what I should do with my life. It was one of those gray days in the capital when you feel a lid has been clamped over the top of the city, leading you to stew. What nagged at me was the futility of it all. When I was younger, I kicked a can of meaningfulness down the road, figuring it was all going to make sense later. And every time I caught up with that can, i just give it another whack. But at this point, verging on retirement, my family unmoored, and still no cat in my life, I found it unnerving to see that empty road still stretching out in front of me. Wasn't it supposed to lead somewhere, eventually, leaving me with, me with the sense that I'd arrived? or should I be trying a different direction? I made it halfway down the street when I looked up and saw a man floating in front of a high brick wall. <laughs> Dressed all in blue, the guy was sinking quickly through the air, though not as fast as gravity would ordinarily demand. And though he didn't tumble or crash the way I would have, he didn't tumble or crash the way I would have if I were falling from the sky. Young and slender with a bit of beard, he stood erect during the descent with one hand calmly raised. He was still about 40 feet up when I realized that the wall behind him was the backside of the perennially crumbling local church. That's when the penny dropped. That pose, this place, a descent, it was the second coming. <laughs> Probably at Sunday school or in sermons, they prepare people for this sort of thing, but as a lifelong miscreant, I was caught off guard. What are you supposed to do in this situation? Avert your gaze, or get out your phone and snap a selfie. <laughs> At first, I was surprised he'd choose this street, barely more than an alley, really, for his return. The other side of the church would have been better, where he could descend onto the front steps before a cheering and awestruck crowd, or at least in front of the guys who usually recline on those steps while sipping cans of beer. Or how about right in the center of town, where there's a honking big cathedral that's pretty much designed for stuff like this? <laughs> But upon reflection, it seemed right he'd choose a humble neighborhood like mine, with practically no one to witness him. 
the hard hat struck me as excessively cautious. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I guess he hadn't had a lot of practice. By my calculation, this was just his second time. <laughs> 20 feet away, he touched down on the asphalt, arms splayed for balance, bending to absorb the impact, since even the godhead is at risk of knee trouble later in life. <laughs> then I saw the harness, and my new faith flickered. He unbuckled himself from the cable. On the ground before him lay a few hammers in different sizes. He picked up a silver lunchbox. Turns out, the guy was one of those acrobats the construction crews call a cordiste a fellow who swings from the rooftops to inspect the hard-to-reach nooks rappelling down the walls. They are doing repairs on the church. And while this savior of masonry dug into his sandwich, I resumed the trek home, a new spring in my step. You go through the years hoping to unwrap the gift of life to find out what's inside. But maybe it's an empty box. The surprise is simply that there is no surprise. And while that isn't much, it's better than no surprise. Thank you so very much. And now I think we retire. Do we socialize? Do we socialize? Do we socialize? We go we to socialize. sign books and oh, we socialize sign books. as we are signing. Right. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a wonderful. Mm -hmm. And folks, I'm happy to sign books, but I am going to be doing pretty quickly. So I'm just going to sign some books. If there's one you really want signed for me personally, great. Otherwise, I'll be a big stack of signed books, and I'm going to run off to dinner. So thank you so much for having us. Thanks for your help. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.